Hello everyone. What does it mean to really care for another? I mean really care, to accept others, warts and all. If you were here last week, we challenged ourselves as a congregation and as individuals to move beyond friendly to caring. Now, I would encourage you, if you were not here, to go back and listen to the sermon as it serves as a foundation for where we are going this week. And let me, let me remind you quickly where we've been. So last week, following Jesus' resurrection in John chapter 1, 21, Peter was instructed to feed the sheep, to take care of Jesus' sheep. He instructed Peter to do this three times. Peter, if you love me, will you care for my sheep? The word feed and care for my sheep is actually a shepherding term, how you tend to the sheep. In essence, Jesus is telling Peter, you need to move from the mindset of a fisherman, one that throws the fish back, the undesirable ones, and learn to have a shepherding mindset, one in which you lay down your, your life for the sheep. Now, if you remember, the sheep were counted, all 153 of them. I remember Jesus, and remember Jesus asked him to count the fish. That's what I believe. Why? He wanted to make a point. Everyone matters. So how about us? That's the question we asked last week. How about us? How do we move beyond friendly to caring? Are we fishermen who pick and choose those to whom we will give our care? Or are we shepherds having concern for every sheep? And let me say this about Lake Homa. I know we care. And I know, I know we want to care more. Moving beyond friendly to caring. And some of you are experiencing those intimate relationships. Oh man, you share those connections with others. There's openness, there's acceptance, there's accountability. It's just awesome. While others struggle to connect. There's a desire to have that one group, those guys or those gals, to, to which one can be completely honest and open, where lives are on full display, warts and all. But is this realistic? Is it possible? I believe it is. But, but there's still a stigmatism. If you knew me like I know me, I don't know if you would like me, right? In other words, I don't want to air my dirty laundry with just anyone, or I'm not qualified to listen to anyone else's problems. So what if? What if we could be completely honest with each other? To be treated with respect and love and do so without judgment. Okay, so last week I connected my pastor friend with a professional during a lunch. He is now in touch with another who has been on the same journey, who knows the struggles he's going through. And, and here's what I know regarding this experience so far. His connection with this professional does not relinquish my caring. Yes, there is someone else who can walk with him. But it does not mean my caring ends and I can return to the friendly relationship I had before the Spirit of God nudged me four weeks ago. And here's why. Actually, my, my pastor friend called me a day after our luncheon, struggling, asking me to pray with him on the phone. What thoughts went through my head? I'm thinking, I've handed you off. I've connected you to a professional. I've done my caring. How long is this going to go on? How long am I to care, God? I've done the work you gave me to do. I responded to the nudging of your spirit. <laughs> Have you ever been there with a friend or a family member? When I saw who was calling me, I knew my pastor friend was in trouble. I knew what he wanted from me. He wanted my time. What should I do? Dropping, drop him like a hot potato, as the expression goes, what would your answer be? I can hear some of you saying, James, you must answer the phone. You must keep on going. What others of you may say, there's only so much you can do for others, James. You don't have to feel guilty by not answering your phone. Yeah, the two sides of a coin. And let me give you the answer to caring, to seeing people as sheep and not as fish. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's not an, as easy to entangle the nuances of true caring as we think it is. This is not a black and white issue. And let me ask you another question. How many of you did your homework this past week? 
How many of you prayed every day for the Spirit of God to open your eyes, to see beyond the veneer of another to their hurts, their habits, and their hang-ups? Were any of you pricked by the Spirit to move, to reach out to another person that God placed up on your heart? Now remember, prayer is the first practical step in moving forward. We talked about that last week. If we are going to care, our hearts and our eyes must be open. The only way this happens is constant prayer, asking God to make us aware of those for whom we cross paths to see their hurts, their habits, and their hang-ups. But I want to add a verse to that, which we didn't cover last week. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. All right, you see the passage on the screen. Do you remember the verses surrounding this verse, the story? You remember when I told you earlier that caring is complicated? All right, let's get into it. Let's kind of get into why it's complicated. Okay, so Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, and John earlier in this chapter to be one of his disciples. These men lived in the same town, Bethsaida. And after the calling, Jesus travels to Capernaum, six miles away, and enters the synagogue where he casts down an evil spirit from an individual crying out, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Everyone is astounded with the healing of this man so that the fame of Jesus spread throughout the surrounding area of Galilee. Mark says Jesus immediately left the synagogue and went back to Bethsaida to Peter's home, where Peter's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. Jesus heals her that evening. The word gets out of her healing, and at sundown, they brought to him all those who were sick or oppressed by demons. The whole city gathered at the front door of Peter's home. Look at verse 34. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. All right, here is where our theology of caring gets complicated. Because look what happens next. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Why? Why? Why is everyone looking for Jesus the next morning? Remember this? This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. There are currently only four who have been called to be Jesus' disciples. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And these new recruits, they are excited. The healings, the casting out of demons. How much better could this get? We are caring for those who are sick. We are caring for those who have demons. Our ministry will be about fixing and making people whole, fixing the physical needs of those who are sick, and releasing those who have been held captive by the demons. This is going to be fantastic. Remember what Jesus was doing early in the morning. Remember? He's praying. It's what I asked you to do this week. Look around and see if the Spirit moves you to engage with one who needs care. Jesus is praying, connecting to his Father. But look at verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Remember, the first step moving from friendly to caring. What is it? I've already said it a couple of times. It's prayer. But, but... Does Jesus' prayer time lead to more healings, more demons released from their captives? Look at verse 38. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. What? What? Jesus chose preaching over healings? Jesus chose proclaiming the word of God over casting out demons. Can you hear the disciples? Can you hear the chatter as they are leaving Bethsaida? What are we doing? Does our teacher not care? Does our teacher not care for those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who are demon-possessed? What could be more important than caring for the needs of others? 
What could be more important than moving beyond friendly to caring in this town? Or maybe in this church? And here's the dynamic tension in which we all live. Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, how many of us have felt guilty for not doing enough? Not caring enough, for not engaging as we have been told we should? All of us have been there. You should stop and help that individual. You should spend more time with. And often we're made to feel guilty for our lack of care, our lack of engagement. And yes, yes, we must come face to face with this tension, this tension of caring. Yes, we are to think of others before we think about ourselves. Yes, we are to love God and we are to love others as ourselves. That's all true. What is true caring? True caring is built around a God-given purpose for our lives. What was Jesus' purpose? What was he on this earth to do? Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Is this not the most caring attribute of Jesus? To offer salvation to the lost, to you and to me? Sure, yes, yes, Jesus cares for the sick. He cares for the demon-possessed. But his greatest care, his greatest care is the salvation he can bring to the human soul, right? Yes, Jesus cares for the sick. But he cares more about the eternal destination of man, the salvation of our souls. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So, so this tension of caring for others must be balanced with the purpose and calling that God has given us. I say, how many individuals do you know who have, who have cared for others but have neglected their own families? I know you think I'm blurring the lines of moving from friendly to caring, but I don't think so. It's complicated. Okay, fathers, fathers, this is your day. What is our purpose as fathers? Is it not to care for our family, our wives and children, to be the spiritual leaders of our homes? And how many fathers do you know who are absent, absent from their wife and children? And then they fail to carry that mantle of caring for their family. Oh, we pick and choose and throw back that which we do not like. You may say, but I bring home the paycheck. Good for you. Good for you. But how are you caring for your family? Is our calling just to work and bring home the bacon? Or is our purpose much more? See, Jesus left Bethsaida because he cared. He was on a mission, a God-given mission to care for the souls of humanity. And he knew he could not complete this mission in his current environment. Moving from friendly to caring is complicated. It's about purpose. It's about what's going on in your heart and where God is directing you. So do I believe Lake Homa can be more transparent, more open and honest with each other, sharing our burdens together as a family of God and caring for others' needs? Absolutely. Do I believe we can go deeper than our usual friendly expressions, expressions of love? Yes. In my 40 years of ministry, I have noticed that most of our spaces instill a false sense of well-being in us. This false sense of well-being expresses itself in statements such as, I love my church. I love this family. I love the hugs. I love the children's ministry, etc. And I'm afraid this is all some of us know. Many of us have never been in a place where authenticity, accountability, and transparency exist. We put, when we get to church, we put up fences. Oh, we're very friendly. But caring for the sheep is not easy. It takes work. Here's a question. What would it look like for Lake Homa to be a shepherd sheep church? What would it look like if all of us accepted the mantle, all of us accepted the mantle of being a shepherd while also being a sheep? What if we knew the hurts, habits, and hangouts of others and did not hold judgment against them? And as shepherds, we walked with those sheep in a caring and grace-filled way. And what if, what if as sheep, we were more transparent, open, and honest, willing to be vulnerable? So how do we move from being friendly to caring? Okay, let's fill in some blanks this morning, hopefully giving some practical instructions for us to move beyond friendly to caring. Okay, here's number two. 
take one take one's mind off self. Philippians 2 verses 3 through 5 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Selfishness is Satan's agent for our lack of caring for others. We know this. We see it in our lives. When we look to ourselves and not the interests of others, we are selfish and often lack caring. Paul's instruction, have the same attitude as Christ. Caring must become an action and not just a feeling. Mark 5 verse 30, at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? <laughs> okay, there's a greater lesson here that I have time for. But Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, who lay sick with a fever. And while on his way to this emergency to assist his synagogue ruler, a, rom- a woman with a blood disease touches the hem of Jesus' garment. His prayer, the braided threads which are on the corners of his robe, they are called zitzits. Why does she do this? Why does she reach out in her desperation and touch Jesus so healing comes out of him? She does it because she knows her text. She knows her text. Malachi 4 verse 2 says, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. In the corners of his garment, Jesus stops. And as he was moving toward helping a dying child, Jesus stops to care for this woman. There is an interruption. Jesus stops on his way to this emergency. In our efforts to care for others, we often forget to allow time to care for the small interruptions on the way. Caring must become an action and not just a feeling, which leads to my next point. Be observant of others. In Luke chapter 10, verse 33, it says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. And we mentioned the beginning of the Good Samaritan story last week. You know, the priest and Levite passed by and did not help the one who had been beaten and robbed. But the Samaritan does. He sees one who is hurting and moves toward and not away. And I'm afraid our tendency is to move away and not forward. Remember the priest and the Levite were in the business of caring and failed to do so? Not only is the Samaritan observant, but he reaches out to the man's needs. And that's number five, reach out. Luke 10, verse 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. Do you notice what the Samaritan had on him as he was traveling? He had tools, he had equipment, oil, wine, bandages. He had the emergency first aid kit with him. Everything necessary to get this man taken care of. The Samaritan reached out with what he had to assist this man. Now, it would have been easier for me four weeks ago to ignore my pastor fan, who was more of an acquaintance at that time. The first kit I have with me was limited. We, I, we pray together. We can eat together. We looked at scripture together. And I inquired about his struggles, just asking him questions. This is all I have in my first aid kit to help my friend. And what's in your first aid kit? And I want you to remember this phrase. Do for the one what you can do. Do for the one what you can do. We are only able to give another what is in our own first aid kit. Many of you have much better emergency tools and equipment in your tool in your first aid kit than I did. Do you are so good at this? I've watched you with others, and thank you for reaching out, using your first aid kit to God's glory. Man, keep it up. And number six, serve instead of waiting to be served. Jesus says the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, this is probably redundant. Jesus came to serve, to give his life as a ransom for others. Serving is a form of caring. 
an opportunity to go deeper in one's relationship with others. Serving begins with small acts of kindness to another. So what can you do this week to reach out to another, to go beyond friendly to caring? And number seven, remember our caring may be an avenue by which another is healed. James 5 verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Remember, it's the power of the holy who brings the healing to one's life. We are to be vulnerable with others, sharing with another, being transparent and open with each other. Okay, I go back to where we began today. Our caring begins and ends with prayer. All of us need prayer. See, prayer is a motivator for us to care. Prayer is, is the way we have eyes to see the needs of others. Prayer is wisdom, the wisdom needed to act. Prayer is the healing which comes from the power of the holy. Prayer is our beginning, middle, and end. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Our action steps begin with the same action step as last week. Begin with prayer. Pray and put some of these action steps in place this week. And then pray some more. Prayer is the most powerful tool in our first aid kit, which rarely gets used. As we encourage each other to go beyond friendly to caring, I pray these simple reminders will help us move beyond friendly to caring. I love you, Lycoma. Blessings. Blessings.